Hello, I'm back. Um, this is part two of a video that has been filmed on um, May the 8th. Um, and um, the, the first video um, was long enough for me to be able to upload with our poor internet speeds. So carrying on um, today, um, I'm going to go through some emails that I've received uh, asking questions or asking for advice and um, I'm very happy to help where I can. If I don't know the answer to something I will say there's no shame in not knowing the answer and never be afraid to ask me a question. There is never a silly question. If you're thinking of something somebody else is thinking of that as well. Okay so um, Yes, somebody said in one of my recent videos, I showed some work in progress with what you called threads on the go. Would you mind explaining what you mean by threads on the go? Now, that wasn't a special term. Um, it was literally a thread that I had on the go. It was a thread I was stitching with. I had to stop and I had to start another thread and I wanted to do another little bit of stitching before I went back to that other thread and um, there was no needles on the threads because of Bertie Boo, my dog. I'm always very, very worried about dropping a needle and um, him stepping on it or even swallowing it. So um, I try to work with very few needles. I always like to know how many needles I've got out so I can account for that number of needles. So threads on the go is not a technical term. Um, it's literally a thread that was in use. Um, oh yes, um, in my last video, I talked about the way that you handle 103. And um, I said that I stitched two-handed, so I gave my uh, left hand, my underneath hand, um, a slight twist, anti-clockwise. And um, I had an email from somebody saying, well, I don't stitch two-handed, I just stitch one-handed. Um, so if I was stitching one-handed, um, I would probably still, as I pulled my thread through, I would twist it. Um, but also, um, it's so unusual for me to stitch with my right hand on the top, but I did try this um, last night. And when I pull my thread up, I would literally just rotate the needle just in my fingers. It's, it's very hard to show. And I did think about trying to film it, but because the needle is so small and the action is so slight, I don't think it would pick up. So basically, if that was my needle, as I was pulling it through, I would just slightly turn it. And how much you would roll the, that's it, roll the needle through your fingers would depend on the angle in which you pull your thread up. But you'll soon get a sense of it because you'll see if your, your thread is fighting against the twist and the natural Z or Z uh, twist of the the thread when i said z and z i don't mean s s twist is something separate in england we say z in the us you say z but z and z is the same thing okay i hope that made sense um oh right um I'm going to leave that one to last because it relates to some samplers I've got out. A question I had on Facebook Messenger was, um, how do I tackle a large uh, sec uh, design or motif? Well, um, if we look at the fire and if we look at this section um, here, like it's very easy to think, oh gosh, I've got to stitch here, go off there, along, around there, up there, down there, up there, like, and, you know, it's one band, but you don't have to stitch that band in one. Always, um, when you are facing a task, don't look at it as an overall task, break it down into bite-sized pieces. And I think that I learned that 
very early on because I'm dyslexic. When I open something and look at it, sometimes it's just a mass of spaghetti and I've got to stop and I've got to focus down into something. So whenever I start something, I don't look at it overall. I always hone in on sections. Always break something down into bite-sized manageable pieces and that way you don't get overwhelmed. Okie dokie. Um, a question about Jane Fiddis. Can Jane Fiddis be stitched on Ada? Well, Jane isn't charted to be stitched on Ada. There are sections of Jane that will be tricky to stitch on Ada. So, for example, this satin stitch um, at the bottom of this little sort of almost a heart, that would be tricky to stitch on Ada. But you can change this. You could photocopy the page of the graph as a working copy and you could uh, mark out cross stitches to get this shape and then you could stitch this in cross stitch rather than satin stitch. Let me just show you that area. You see this is satin stitch but you can change that into cross stitch. The um, plat stitch you can work as cross stitch if you want but plat stitch will work on Ada. Stem stitch which is in the bird's breast that would be a little bit tricky um, on Ada. Um, but you can substitute that. Uh, let's find where he is in the graph. Yes. Now, here's this bird on the graph. And these little dotted lines are where you would do uh, stem stitch. But you can just fill in these spaces with cross stitch. So that's perfectly doable. These you can do on Ada. Um, the uh, turkey work lawn, um, that could work on Ada, you could try, but what you can do is rather than do the turkey work, you can just fill this lawn in with, um, with cross stitch. And the satin stitch that runs underneath, you could just substitute those satin stitches for cross stitch. Just, as I said, photocopy the page for a working copy only and then just draw on your photocopy working out how you could put cross stitches instead of the satin stitch. Now there is an over one dog here and over one is um, tricky but what you could do again is make a working copy and then redesign the dog. Um, you could replace um, the dog with the cat that's the other side. Um, especially if you are a cat lover. Here's the cat. Oh, no, the other side. There he is. So you could replace the dog with a second cat. Or you can just design a dog with cross stitch over two. Where there's a will, there's a way. Um, so, um, you know, if you want to join in the stitch along, and we are having great fun already, you know, it's something that you can modify the chart to uh, suit your stitching capabilities. Okay, um, what else? Uh, oh, yes. My question concerns framing reproduction samplers. My antique samplers are framed with the moulding close to the outside stitched border. In reproduction sampler charts, there is a space of ground fabric showing between the stitch border and the frame. What is better? In the past, I had my reproductions framed with the frame moulding close to the border as my antiques. Is there a reason not to frame this way or only personal preference? When it comes to framing your samplers, you frame them as you want. They're your samplers, they're going to hang on your wall and you're going to look at them. Like obviously if you're framing a antique sampler, you have a duty of care. So it should be framed so that the sampler is safe, that it's on uh, acid-free board, 
that it's um, airtight, the framing and the glass is off the, um, off the needlework. But whether you um, have a mold, uh, a mat board around it and then the frame, or whether you frame close to the side, it's your choice. And I've had a little bit of a journey with my framing. Now, um, I was trying to think about all those years ago when I first started, and I suspect that this was probably the very first piece that I had framed and um, I chose to have this framed um, with a double mat board. Now I know in the States you call these something else but in the UK we call them mat board. So I had a double one um, and I thought that looked lovely and I still think that looks really, really nice. Um, in the background I've got um, Dutch Beauty. She's too heavy to lift and too wide to get in the video, but I put her there. As you can see, um, and in fact, I'll go and hold her. I'm going to need help to get her back up from the, on the wall. <laughs> so heavy. Oh. I had Dutch Beauty framed with no mat board and quite widely spaced from the stitching. Um, let's put her back. I'm always afraid of these falling over and smashing. Um, when I stitched Alwyn Horwood's um, blue ribbon sampler, I chose to have a matte board and then a darker double matte board to pick out the um, the greens in the sampler. So that's how I decided to frame the blue ribbon sampler. This is a lovely sampler to stitch. I really, really enjoyed stitching that. Um, now, when I frame needlework, I like to get, oops, there's not enough room here for everything. I like to frame um, close to um, the edge of the stitching and probably it'd be nicer to get it closer than um, this again. But um, it all comes down to personal preference. My framer, he says, oh, it's too close, it's too close. Um, but I do like it very close, you know, almost touching. This is a lovely sampler. This is um, Jane Jackson. And Jane was due to be taught at the beginning of June at the Declay uh, chapter of the EGA and for the Tudor Rose in um, Dallas in September. But both of those have been postponed um, until it's safe to fly. Um, that's a fabulous sampler. Um, now, I wanted to show you, um, oh dear me, right. um, Mary Stead. And that was our first little gem. And as you can see, Mary is framed very, very close to the needlework. And this is how they were, they, they were done in centuries past. Um, I think it really complements the work framing them so close, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, this sampler, um, Mary Anna Delphine, um, is a sampler that I acquired from Whitney Antiques, and Whitney Antiques like to frame their um, samplers um, in keeping to what they would have been framed when they were um, finished by the little girls. And as you can see, with this sampler, um, Mary Ann actually sort of stitched, uh, let me do it this way, she sort of stitched a frame herself with her stitching. This is a beautiful sampler. Love those birds. Um, 
What I loved about this sampler um, is the little girl um, stitched her um, her verse, and it's the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, and then she puts, surely goodness and mercy sh shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell <clears throat> in the house of the Lord forever. And then her needlework teacher stitched on this as well. And she stitched that the child that has done this may be the subject of the preceding lines is the prayer of her teacher, Sarah Goldsborough. So we know the name of the teacher and the name of the little girl. I just thought that was so, so sweet. And um, on this particular visit to Whitney, I was just happening to go past <laughs> with a little diversion and um, I was very good. I left my handbag in the car, so no credit card, so I couldn't buy anything. And I saw this sampler and I just honed in on, on this. But I couldn't buy it because I didn't have my credit card. So I went out and I actually started the engine of my car and my husband phoned me. <laughs> he said, and he must have been watching me on the phone, he said, have you bought anything? And I said, no, I said, I've been ever so good. And he said, get back in there and buy something. <laughs> so uh, that's how Mary Ann happened to come home with me. And I'm very glad she did. She's a beautiful sampler. I love this little girl's embroidery skills. She was a very gifted little girl. A very, look at very gifted girl with a needle. Would you like to read this verse yourselves if I hold it up? I'm going to just uh, say to you, freeze the frame if you would like to read it because it's quite a lot and the sample is very, very heavy. Um, it was thought um, that this sampler may have been American, but um, since I bought the sampler, more family history records have become available and um, I do believe that this little girl was English. And I think at some stage it must have been uh, bought by somebody who lived in America and um, then it was bought back from America um, to Whitney Antiques. Anyway, um, I hope you've enjoyed um, this video. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to say. Dutch Beauty, let me move this out of the way and let me bring her back into the picture. I felt really, really sorry um, the other day because somebody showed a photograph of um, a piece of needlework where she had spilt coffee over her uh, tray that held her needlework. And it was heartbreaking, her threads, her linen, everything had been covered in coffee. Now, I have a story to tell you about <laughs> Dutch Beauty. Right, okay, that will have to do. Um, when I was stitching uh, Dutch Beauty, I was stitching on a hoop. This goes back a long, long way. Dutch Beauty was my very first piece I did on linen. And I dozed off and um, my husband had made me a cup of tea or a mug of tea and he put it on my stitching table and when I woke up I um, picked my my hoop on my 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 linen and obviously you can see there's a lot of linen I went to put it down on my side table not realizing there was a cup of tea there and it all spilt all over this piece and I was heartbroken because I'd stitched three quarters of it so I um, and, and this is stitched with DMC I dashed to the sink, rinsed it under the sink several times, uh, kept on rinsing it, and I could not get the stain out of it. Um, you could actually see this area here, um, a tea stain, but a very faint tea stain. So I thought, what can I do to salvage this? If I'd only stitched a little bit of it, I would have... Um, Whew, that was heavy. I would have started again, but I had stitched three quarters on it. And this is a big thing. I nearly died when I saw this linen when it first came. <laughs> it's 32 or 36 count. 
So I decided to finish it. And then when I finished it, I made a cup of tea <laughs> in the bath. I put some tea bags in the bath and um, only like a weak mixture. And I actually put the whole um, sampler back into the, the bath of tea, swished it around a little bit and then well rinsed it so that the whole sampler just aged a little bit and you can hardly see that original tea stain. So that's my little story about spilling um, a hot drink over my needlework. After that I decided no more hoops, um, I was going to stitch on a frame and uh, there's a strict uh, rule of no hot drinks or any type of drink other than water close to my needlework. Um, we all learn the hard way. Anyway, um, I'm going to start to ramble, so I'm going to say stay safe, stay well, and until the next time, bye-zee-bye.